Well, greetings everyone. It's been a while since I've made a video. I've been very busy these past few months. Uh, kid was sick, I was sick. Um, new fatherhood is rather interesting, I guess to say the least. In any event, I thought I'd give some updates on things I've been tracking recently and things that have stood out to me. So, I'm going to start with this. Um, one, is, let's be going with CVS. Um, I've been coming across some interesting information about how they're almost putting a lot more into digital health recently. So I saw this news about $325 million that they're going to be spending on digital health in 2019. Uh, if you're interested to see more about that, you can read their one report. Uh, there's a transcript available on Seeking Alpha um, that gives their uh, uh, fourth quarter uh, transcripts as well. But what it goes down into and talks about, about is how they want to expand new technology um, and kind of lead to more transformation, which is kind of broad, but I think it's going to be chronic care initiatives. And I guess the biggest reason why this, if we want to kind of nail it down, would be this whole thing with Aetna. I think that's the bottom line. They, they now have a vertical pipeline of patients. They're going to have to figure out how to leverage our services to reduce cost overall. And I think that's going to be the biggest thing for them. So one thing that stood out was recently CVS launched these health hubs. There's three of them, to my knowledge, that, that are being piloted in, I believe, Texas. And they're supposed to provide different services out there for uh, patient care. And, um, I mean, the images look very interesting. Uh, you can see, like, they provide uh, diabetes management, preventive care and wellness, uh, dietitian services, health insurance navigation, primary acute care, which is going to be like their mini clinics, as you can see. But where does pharmacy fall into play here? And I'm seeing other pushes from, let's say, Walgreens, who's like um, exploring like these little digital kiosks inside their pharmacies, either uh, for like, de like dental. And CVS is trying to turn their pharmacies into a health hub. What I would like to see is that there's any more exploration in terms of how it can apply to digital health overall. And I think that's going to be something that really stands out to me at the end of the day. Um, so there's this, this, if you want, it's a short little PDF just talking about what they're trying to do. Um, next, next is, this is a little older, but it goes along the same idea. Walgreens is partnering up with Microsoft to explore digital health care as well. And I think we're going to see CVS also do something similar. I think we're going to see CVS and Walgreens kind of start headbutting now, just like Pharma has been teaming up with different tech companies. We're going to see them kind of go the same route. And if that's the case, it's going to be quite fascinating to see who partners with who and what they're going to pursue at the end of the day. Um, so this other thing is that I've been seeing a lot is uh, direct-to-consumer telemedicine. And... Telehealth is huge right now. We've been hearing more and more about it. For pharmacy, several things that have come up that I think are really good to identify and show is things like this. So these direct-to-consumer pharmacy services. Um, so Kick Health, for instance, is one for anxiety, basically prescribes propranolol, uh, which is a beta blocker that helps you relax. And we've seen this for other things. So propranolol, if you guys aren't aware of, uh, can help out with some forms of anxiety. Uh, so people take it for like um, before they give public talks. Um, other people do it even for fine motor controls such as golfing, or even for shooting practice. So you might see um, those being used. Of course, they're banned now in the Olympics because of that. But uh, in some sports. But here, it's like a direct-to-consumer company that basically will you fulfill a questionnaire, talk to someone, and you get a beta blocker. That's quite fascinating. On the same heels, we also had the whole thing with Pill Club recently getting $51 million uh, for more telemedicine and services. And Pill Club is basically geared around for women's health to help them get an oral birth control. Other competitors would be like NARCs and such. And my previous videos in the past, I've talked about how companies like Romon have taken off or now called Ro. They've gone into smoking cessation. They've expanded their uh, men's health. We have Hims who just recently launched HERS. Um, they're targeting all these different things. I'll probably do a cast later on talking about all these little different companies and what products and services they offer. One of my ongoing products for, uh, projects right now is I'm actually trying to see what are these low, la low hanging fruits that these companies get into and what's the middle area that they can't tackle. And is that an area that pharmacy could probably tap into more? Because I think these low hanging fruits we've kind of lost at this current point. But in the same, just we see other reports coming out 
kind of almost not quite lambasting, but addressing the issue behind these uh, direct-to-consumer uh, services. Even like if we talk about ED, if we talk about erectile dysfunction, even that has some limitations. It's not like you throw Viagra at everyone and suddenly everyone's going to have a um, erection and going to be perfectly fine. There could be underlying issues that hopefully you could screen and identify. They, those could be psychological, for instance, uh, or underlying heart disease, the things that you need to target and address as well conducively for that whole uh, level of patient care and a continuum of care. And these uh, DTC uh, products may interfere with that. And I think this is where a lot of physicians and a lot of groups are getting concerned because, yes, this is a needed product and they help bypass the way a doctor's office, which is annoying. But how does that information get broadcasted over to a spectrum of care so that no one gets left out or it's not a warning sign of something else that may be major coming up? Some other news is Kaya Health. And I don't know if I'm saying it right. I don't know if it's Kaya or Kaya. Um, this looks like to be a company to me that's going to be heading into the digital therapeutics market here probably within the next year. They're known more for back pain and exercises and things you can do to help out with some of these chronic pains. Um, I find it quite fascinating to see how far they've taken this product service. And I would definitely recommend if you're interested to see how people are using just this kind of digital therapies for pain management. Um, this is one product that's come across my radar that I'm following pretty closely. Next up is Great Call. So if you can recall, Great Call got bought out by Best Buy for $800 million last year. And this was an interview with Moby Health News that was talking about remote monitoring. And I think these guys are on the right path because I think home health care, I think senior care is going to be the next field for digital health because at the end of the day, I stand by it. Most people will want to stay in home as long as possible and will pay almost any amount of money they can to stay at home and not go to a hospital. So that means paying money for sensors, or that means paying money for other camera systems that they can put in a home that you can advocate would lead to better care so they don't have to leave their house and do logistical areas or things along that line. I think that's where people are going to be throwing money. So this is quite an interesting interview. I'd highly recommend if you're if you are passionate about this like I am, give this a read uh, and then start asking questions. Who else is doing this as well? I'm going to close out this. So, product came across my radar I saw. This is Daya Med, and it's their Med Pod. And what this thing is, if you look at it, it looks very much like a multi-dose delivery system. Except, they come with these little cartridges, so it looks... I can't tell if these are plastic cartridges or they're cardboard cartridges. I think they're cardboard, and I'm going to guess that a pharmacy fills them, sends them to a patient, and the patient slides them in here. And it's interesting, because... If we think about multi-dose delivery systems like Topac or Ultra Health or Ultra, or Ultra Pharmacy, they're all behind having the strip packaging or multi-dose delivery system. And the one thing, though, has been how do you not only help people remind but also track information and provide an ancillary service on top of it. So Daya Med has this MedPod. This reminds me a little bit of Spencer's Health. Um, if you've seen that one in the past, it also has the ability to put a strip package system in there and dispense down in a robot. This is this looks way smaller though. That's one thing that gets me is uh, I wonder if it's more travel friendly or not. Um, but it's it's quite uh, here. You can see how it just fits in there, pops it out. This also looks like the one that was made by Philips a few years ago. That I think it was a Medumo. Um, so I think this is going to be quite interesting in terms of adherence tracking and how people might want to use this. I swear, when I, look, when I look at these things, you can tell they were made by someone that's like a designer that's never really had a deal with an EHR, like an idealized version. It looks great, but I just don't know how it works with functionality. <laughs> but yeah, okay, critic aside. Um, so let's talk about some publications I've been coming across that I think you guys should probably read or look into. This one's published in Jamer. Um, this is for... Um, this is rather interesting because I never really thought about this, but we've always heard this critique that people who use wearable devices are much more inclined to be more healthy overall or more interested in their health. So if that's the case, um, what we'd have to consider is what other things might they be healthy about or what might pay attention to. So what they actually did is they looked at the use of basically wearable devices and such and digital uh, health activity tracking, and they look at basically um, proportion of days covered or PDC um, which is a 
if you're not aware of that, basically what you do is you look at claims data from a pharmacy and an insurance company. So ideally, a medication should last anywhere between 30 days supply or one month or 90 days supply or three months. And that a patient would then theoretically at the end of 30 days pick up their medication and constantly stay in a zone where they always have the day's supply they need. And you can look at their billing or co-pays or going to the pharmacy and getting it covered. And from that, you can see like, oh, this person picked it up but then they picked it up 45 days later. So that means 15 days wasn't covered, which means that they were probably not using their medications as directed and therefore were not adherent. So anyway, coming back to this, when they looked at people with PDC data and also looked at their use of other services, and what they found was that there was actually a relationship. I, I find this quite interesting. The people who are using more digital activity trackers tend to be more adherent to a lot of their chronic disease management medications, such as for hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. That's cool. I, I, I really wonder, you know, it comes back to, down to this habit forming tracking. Are these people just naturally more inclined to be more adherent because and therefore adherent to other technologies? Or is it being cognizant of the other things may lead them to form better, healthier habits? I don't know. This is this is quite interesting. I would highly recommend reading this because it's something that is really on my right is like something I'm, I'm going to come back to a few times and look over this and see if this is something that people might want to like go back and say, like, this is a way to get people to consider their health more. Um, the other thing is talking about always financial incentives. So we have companies like Wealth um, and a few others who basically, you know, pay patients to take their medications. Now, this wasn't using Wealth or any of those other ones, um, but this was more of like an RCT looking at financial incentives. And these things have been good and bad over the years. I'm still not sure how I feel about the whole behavioral economics area in health. Um, but this one basically did not seem like it led to any positive. Um, yeah. A financial incentive intervention to improve LDC control was not associated with changes in the patient's uh, activation or autonomous motivation. Increase in the patient autonomous motivation is a predictive long term. Uh, so it doesn't look like it was really a positive trial. I haven't read this one yet, but it's on my reading list. But again, it always comes back to this whole behavioral economics and, you know, more data is better. I just like to see what their intervention here was using. Next we have is one from up. Oh, this is uh, for oral chemotherapy, which we're seeing a lot of growth. Um, I think we're going to see other companies put digital therapeutics, I mean, digital um, medicines together, such as Proteus. I think this is going to be inevitable uh, just because there's such expensive medications. But this one was actually looking at app, if I can recall. So they were using a mobile app uh, to help out patients with their adherence. And I'm trying to remember what this thing was called. I probably skipped it, but yes. Anyway, um, it's basically yeah, a smartphone application um, for, to help basically encourage um, adherence for the study and such. So, from what I can recall, it shows some uh, benefits to it. It's a little lengthy, but I would say if you're in the um, oral cancer market, especially let's suppose that for pharmacy, if your hospital system's uh, providing these kind of services, this might be worth looking into. Um, or might be something to talk about for clinical trials as those can become more uh, prevalent, I would say. Next we have this one. Um, so this is interesting to me because it's a little um, article about how they're going to, in Ontario, start testing out digital health devices and products and trying to validate their use for clinical use. So I just was reading through this. Um, I'd like to see if maybe some U.S. systems might start adopting this, or maybe this is something we're going to see worldwide. It'd be interesting if we come up with like kind of some kind of standard of, of approach, but I don't think it's feasible just because we have such different insurance and practices worldwide. So I guess it's going to just be a regional start in any event. But if this is something coming up, maybe you want to refer back to this and just see what these guys are doing. Uh, this was a cute, cool uh, viewpoint from uh, published in JAMA. Just talking about how smartphones are becoming a new way for people to access EHRs and what that may actually mean overall for clinical care in the end. Because if you think about it, um, Apple's push for their EHR and integration with Epic and such is quite fascinating. And I wonder if that's going to lead to some better um, outcomes in the, later on just because patients have all this access and it communicates with or anything else. They're like the middleman. Um, there's got to be a lot you can do with that. I feel like Amazon wants to start being the middleman for that at some point, but in this case, 
I think Apple might be a little bit further ahead than them. Ah, big pushing we talked about today. Pulmonary. So <clears throat> this is a cool little review of asthma and allergy mobile apps for 2018. But they also talked about uh, inhalers and sparring inhalers. So this is going to be, I'm going to talk about a handful of new studies. So if you're in a pulmonary space, these are probably worth watching. Uh, next one was published in Jamir. Um, this one was against, uh, was the, oh, this was the ADAPT uh, trial that they were using. Um, and they had this tool using an app um, in about 80 adolescents. And what they were doing is they were trying to see if the app could help basically improve asthma function. Um, and they found that they had, there's some things that stood out that they liked. I don't know if it's, I mean, it's a small, I mean, it's a feasibility trial. And there, there's a methodology actually published, I think, a year or two years ago when they did this. But the um, thing that gets me is from a TELUS uh, approach, how they're using this, I think there's some promise. Um, maybe some things from here for other companies to pull out, though, uh, especially if they start dealing with such a younger population. This is something I've got. Um, I don't know if the for, uh, finalized version is out, but um, <clears throat> this is basically for Propeller Health. This is cool. Um, what they've been using with their data, because if, as you can re recall, Propeller Health has the sensor fits on. So if we're talking like a Saba, so let's say like um, Pro Air or Ventolin, we know hypothetically you're supposed to shake it, if you haven't used it in two weeks, spray it to prime it and such, and then you can probably have a sensor on there that can say, oh, do you even prime it? You know, we know we haven't used it in two weeks, where we primed before use. And then also the fact is for Sabas, you're supposed to use it, and then hold your breath, and then wait about a minute before your next dose. So. But what we're seeing here, though, is people are puffing and then puffing again. So they're not doing it appropriately. So even through sensors, we can actually det start detecting improper technique. That's cool. That's really cool because as objective data, I think that we need and it's very valuable. And we can utilize, especially when we start talking to patients about how they're using any type of inhaler. So this is a really cool publication. If you're into the sensor market, start thinking about how you can use these things to detect even just proper use of meds. And then also from a clinical standpoint, how can we start using this to intervene for patients? Um, along with that is the fact that this market's growing huge. I don't know how accurate this is, but saying that this is gonna be a half billion uh, dollar market by 2023, I, I wouldn't disagree. Um, I think this is gonna be a worldwide issue. We know even from issues that some countries are facing, such as China, India, um, we know pulmonary disease is on a rise. Pollution has been incredibly abhorrent. Um, we're probably going to see this become an issue growing worldwide, and that these markets will probably be open up for a lot of this technology at some point. So this could be quite interesting as we start using the inhaler market grow and the sensor-enabled technology coming in. And that leads to the next thing. <clears throat> so a uh, conflict of interest statement is the fact that I have served as um, an on, uh, advisory for Teva, um, but in any event, Teva here is presenting um, about their um, plan of how they're going to use their new smart inhalers and what it really means for clinical trial uh, development and then um, what it could also mean for data collection and what you can do with this in the end. Um, so uh, Moby Health has an interesting write-up about it. I would give that a read just to see where they're trying to go with it. But the pulmonary market is going to be huge here soon. I, I'm really staying by that. Um, you're seeing so many different people come in, thinking about how they can do all this stuff. It, it's 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 great in that respect because I think what we're also going to see is other companies start really looking at, such as I think we you know Oral is already predominantly uh, talked about with Proteus Digital Health with their sensor enabled biodigestible sensors. Um, but then we also have products. Um, like Bay, uh, Bayer's Beta Connect for MS, which is a smart injectable, so you can see when people are using it. Uh, then you also have companies uh, for other sensor-enabled drugs uh, that, like Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly, talking about their um, smart insulin pens. Though, of course, if we talk about those companies, one of the biggest things that's going bigger is the whole uh, automatic pancreas project that they're working on, which will probably, when all this stuff comes out, that'll be number one, this stuff will be second, but it's still rather cool. Next is um, a little thing for pharmacy. Just throwing back as always, just the value of just reusing reminders or short messaging systems such as text messaging and personalized care to tell people with adherence. In this case, it was diabetes. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, 
refer back to this. New publication came out, it looks rather cool. And the last one is, I missed this, and I I think if anyone is doing a review on digital health for pharmacy, this is a really good, nice editorial that was released in Hospital Pharmacy, just talking about different technology for us to consider. I think they hit some of the big things on the head. Um, and they talk about what needs to be done. And I, I'm, I'm behind a lot of this. Like, we need to work more on legislatives. We need to work before on terms of how do we monitor, how do we integrate in patient care. So I think this editorial, if you're writing papers or anything else, I think this is something you should be including in your introduction or discussion points um, for whatever you're doing. Any event, so uh, this is Timothy Yonks with the uh, Digital Apothecary. Um, I'm going to um, put in below a link to my webpage um, that has all these citations and these references. So if you want to read them more in depth, they'll be available there. And along with that, if you want, um, the one project ate me up that I haven't been speaking a lot lately is the fact that I actually put together a primer on digital health. So I'll open that up real quick. Um, all you have to go is to the digitalapothecary.com. And at the top, there should be a banner. Just click on that. What it's going to do is going to take you to um, this primer ebook I put together. It's about 50 pages. And what it covers is um, introduces you to digital health, medication, medication adherence, wearable devices, genomics, smart home, or AI, digital therapeutics, and where I think this stuff's all going to go. If you have been liking these videos, if you have been liking following me, what I've been talking about, this gives a little bit more narrative in terms of where I see it's going. Or if you're looking for a resource to give other pharmacists or other people just to consider where does digital health come for pharmacy, feel free to get into this. This is free. It's on a Dropbox file. So all I have to do is go down here and click download here. And it will go to Dropbox. And then you can just download it off my Dropbox. Or just give me an idea of what you liked about it. Feel free to share with anyone else. So again, signing up. Again, signing up.